I am continuing my video series on the fake history of Melbourne. This is part 2 of the series. If you feel like you've missed anything, check out the previous video, the link is in the description. I recommend watching it to get the full picture. Without further ado, fasten your pants and let's get started. The Fake History of Melbourne Part 2 Old Australia was destroyed in a war. Previous videos showed mysterious ancient grids, ruins, and star forts in the Australian desert. I've also shown that Australia was once part of a fertile and green Antarctic, split off in a cataclysmic event. I believe Australia was attacked and destroyed. The destruction was still ongoing in the late 1800s, as shown by the great fires that broke out across Australian cities around the same time. These are only a few of the many great fires that engulfed Australia in the 1800s, as if entire cities being razed to the ground is something common. Have you ever heard of similar, in modern times? People argue that it's because they built wooden houses, but, we still build wooden houses, and even entire wooden villages today. They don't just burn down for no reason. And have you heard of fires that hollow out and destroy buildings made of brick and stone? Or that destroy rock? Some argue that it's because our ancestors used candles for lighting. So, I ask again. What kind of fire leaves houses in a pile of rubble? This photograph shows Sydney Garden Palace, broken to pieces by the Great Fire. 1879 was not the only year Mel burned. The city experienced another fire in 1889, much larger than the one before it. Why? I believe, most of the old world was burned down, so that it be erased from our memory. If too many had been kept standing, people would ask the kind of questions I am asking here. The Aborigines have oral stories about fire devils coming from the sky. A lunar eclipse in 1859 was taken by Aboriginal tribes to mean the arrival of bad fire spirits out of the sky. I'd be curious to learn what else they had to say about ancient cities, but my bookstore offers only New Age drivel when it comes to Aborigines. Before I continue the video, please give a like if you learned something. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click the notification bell, so you won't miss any update. Finally, watch until the end to avoid any misunderstanding. Thank you. There's a video by fake history researchers, autodidactic, asking where all the bricks to build Melbourne came from. I'm only going to show a small part of the video here, follow the link in the description box if you wish to learn more. Historians actually admit they don't know how these buildings were built. Here's a sample of the official position. Pause the video if you want to read it. Here, we're told that the basalt plains of Victoria is where stonemasons got their materials. As making basalt is a slow process, brickmakers filled the gap. But then the key point of the article is revealed. This industrial heritage has been lost. The brick kilns are now gone. But the bricks remain. They are everywhere. In plain English. We don't know how these buildings were made in such a short time, industrially. The tools are lost, even though there are brick buildings everywhere. I hope the reader grasps the gravity of this. The British love to document everything. Who built it, when it was built, how it was built, with what it was built. But, they can't tell you how their cities were built. A brick kiln is an oven that turns clay into bricks. How is it possible that all the brick kilns are gone? If they're gone, I have to assume they never existed. This is an article in the mainstream Australian newspaper, The Age, is titled, It's a bit Pompeii-like, The Unexpected Buried Blocks of Melbourne. Archaeologists and journalists are befuddled about houses buried below structures that were built in the 1850s and 1860s, because they don't understand there was a city there, before Melbourne was founded. Quoting from the article. What must they have thought, nearly a century ago, when just three feet down in Melbourne clay, their shovels struck a picket fence, its plank still solid, and neatly lined up. At its base, a wooden track appeared, and nearby, the stump of a long-gone chimney. There was no easy explanation for the workers who were digging the foundations for what would become Swanston Street's famous Capitol Theatre, as the building they had just demolished, had stood since 1865. Melbourne, as a European settlement, had only existed for 30 years before that. 
but little else has ever been said or explored, even as other Pompeii-like finds, buried far too deep for such a young city, have been uncovered across Melbourne's downtown area in more recent decades. Archaeologists were no more puzzled than they were in 2017, when they unearthed a preserved city block, the size of four or five tennis courts, several feet below the grounds of Lonsdale Street's Wesley Church. Someone remembered the photo in Annier's book, and the archaeologists floated theories, namely that they were digging into basements. But, how then to explain the evidence of gardens, windows, fireplaces, and that picket fence discovered by Whelan's workers so long ago? The article solves the mystery by saying that house owners were ordered to bury their houses because they were on low-lying swampland. After their houses were buried, they simply built a new Melbourne on top of them. As you might have guessed, this is where the article's views and my views diverge, for a number of reasons. Firstly, the solution to low-lying houses on swampland is to lift them, not bury them. Secondly, if it were swampland, then the council wouldn't have determined that this part of town should be the center of Melbourne and proceed to build downtown there. Here's what really happened, in my view. The same thing that happened all around the world. A flood of mud, followed by excavation of buildings, demolition of other buildings, and plenty of looting under the guise of gold rush. If you find it interesting, I'll continue in part 3. Now, it's time for me to hear from you. What are your thoughts on this video? If you found it interesting or informative, please consider giving it a thumbs up and sharing it with your friends and family. Remember, the more people know about these important topics, the better. Before we wrap up, I want to extend a huge thank you to all the individuals who dedicated their time and energy to research and gather the information presented in this video. Their efforts are truly commendable and have helped shed light on important topics that affect us all. Make sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications to be notified when the next video is uploaded. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.